um, uh, in behalf of the uh, California Association of Healthcare Leaders and the San Diego Healthcare Leaders Advanced Community Team, we would like to uh, welcome you to our uh, sixth webinar series for the Board of Governors uh, exam preparation. So we would like to thank you. We're so happy that you are here with us today. Uh, um, you know, considering that it's Saturday and you should be relaxing uh, at this time now, you, you carve out your time to uh, be with us for the purpose of growth and learning. So kudos to that, to everyone. Thank you. Um, just uh, um, uh, something that we have, uh, I just want to tell you what we have prepared for you for today. So uh, we, we will, you will be introduced to the uh, members of uh, the uh, Advancement Committee meeting, uh, committee. Um, we have invited the two presidents of the chapters to uh, to give us uh, to talk to us and give uh, give us um, give us some welcome remarks, and uh, we have also some presentation slide presentation related to how to prepare for a fellow examination and uh, and the resources that you need to 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 be successful, and we have also invited a guest speaker who can talk to us about tips and you know uh, hints on how to be uh, to prepare for exam and this guest speaker has just passed his fellow exam so um, we have those are the things that we have prepared for you then after that we will dive into the to the question and answers for healthcare okay so um, next slide please so um, these are the uh, members of the committee who dedicated their time and volunteered their time to to uh, to uh, for this uh, webinar series to, ma to materialize. So I'd like to introduce them. I will start my, uh, with myself. I am Michael DeCoco. I'm the chair for the uh, member adv advancement for the call, and I am also a fellow. And I have been with uh, with ACHA call for seven years. And my day job is a director for laboratory uh, radiology and respiratory care at Watsonville Community Hospital. Tui. Thank you, Michael. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's good to see your faces um, and happy, happy to have you all here. Uh, my name is Tui Do, and I am um, a co-chair with uh, the uh, member advance committee at Cal. And I am one of the California program managers uh, for the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center. I'm not yet a fellow, so I think this is a fantastic um, time for me to learn and to grow with you all and be part of this community. Um, I've been uh, with ACHE since 2019, so in and on on three years now and with Cal over oh my goodness the past year and a half so thank you very much for having me um I'll pass it over to Rick Rick you're on mute yes and my day job is to take myself off mute um <laughs> hi I'm Rick Nared my day job really is a professor of health services administration at California State University Chico uh, I teach our classes on health policy health law and starting this spring on emergency management. Um, I've been in with Cal since it started. I was one of the original board members and uh, rotated off the board a few years back, but continued working on this and helping people along on their, their fellow journey is really fun. So very happy to see everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sachin Gangupantala. I am currently a member of the committee. I've been with the Advancement Committee for two years or so, and uh, I became a fellow as of last October. So my journey has been uh, hopefully pretty much um, along the lines that you will uh, go through. I've been a member of uh, Cal and ECHE for five years or so, and um, I am a founder and director of operations for Valley Diabetes and Obesity a private medical practice we have here um, my, with my physician wife. And uh, <clears throat> I think for me, um, it's, it's an honor to walk alongside uh, Rick and Tu and Nora and Michael in, in helping our uh, clinical leaders and healthcare leaders to advance to fellow. And um, as part of um, Cal, I've been um, fortunate enough to take the same training sessions like you are doing now. 
and um, pleased to be here to help you um, get the best of uh, what we are uh, hoping to offer you. Thank you for joining us. Um, good morning, Nora Powers. Um, people, I'm sure, are tired of hearing me say I'm the token payer rep in the chapter. Any of the rest of you that are, represent payers, let me know. Um, so anyway, I'm a committee member and I've been doing this since 2011, but it was only in 2020 that we started doing this via Zoom. For obvious reasons, we couldn't do these in-house anymore, but I think we've come up with a really, really successful format. And, um, and like Rick said, I mean, here we are on a Saturday morning and this is what we wanna do. This is how we give back to our chapter and our industry. So welcome. Next slide, please. And let's hear from our San Diego organizations of healthcare leaders partner. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Michael, Rick, Nora, Sachin, uh, Twee, James. You all have done such a phenomenal job coordinating and putting together this program. It's so rich. Um, you know, I'm Jessica Taylor. I'm the 2022 president of the San Diego Organization of Healthcare Leaders. So it feels like this year has just gone by in the blink of an eye, um, been quite dynamic, I'm sure for all of you as well. And so glad to have you here. And uh, this is one of the most phenomenal review course programs. Um, I got my fellowship in 2018. I was a member, started uh, as a member of ACHG in 2005 when I was in grad school. So some of you I'm sure relate to that journey. And uh, this review program has just been one of the most phenomenal that I've seen. I've been part of several over the course of my ACAG tenure. And um, Cal has just done a phenomenal job of the, the curriculum and uh, test taking strategies. And we've been so fortunate to be part of it. And uh, it certainly is a silver lining of the pandemic that we've been able to offer this as a Zoom. And, and we've been able to, to join along and, and have our San Diego and Southern California members be a part of this. So thank you again to Cal so much for, for including us. And we're glad to be part of it. James? Uh, good morning, uh, James Revels. Uh, I am the uh, co-chair of Career Development for San Diego, San Diego Organization of Healthcare Leaders. Um, my day job, I'm director of finance for Kaiser Permanente. Uh, I also lecture at University of California, San Diego uh, in finance courses. Um, it, it's real an honor to be able to partner with Cal and, um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be able to help, help you all through this um, test taking techniques. So um, uh, thank you for your participation and, uh, and I'll actually be uh, lecturing next weekend on the finance portion um, for this uh, prep course will be given. Thank you. Thank you. So next slide, please. Okay, uh, so uh, I would like to um, uh, invite Michael O'Connell and Jessica Taylor to give us some uh, uh, welcome and uh, uh, short um, self introduction and, and some insights uh, on the importance of um, acquiring or uh, acquiring the fellow um, Amer uh, fellow status of American College of Healthcare Executives. So uh, take, uh, I'll give the floor to Michael O'Connell. Thank you, Michael. Uh, as uh, Michael said, I'm the president for the California Association of Healthcare Leaders. I've been involved uh, with ACHC for quite a few years. I went to St. Louis University and I got my master's in health administration. And my program director at the time was uh, Dr. Tom Dolan. For those of you that may know, Tom Dolan was the president of ACHE for many, many years before Deborah Bowen has now become president. So when I was in graduate school, uh, we had a student chapter and Tom said, uh, just as you get your master's in health administration, it is expected that you become a member of ACHE and you work to obtain your fellowship. He said, would you ever hire a doctor that was not board certified in their specialty? And I said, no. And he said, well, that's the expectation of you as well. You are expected to be able to show that this is your career, this is your profession, and this by having those initials after your name, it's not just the initials, it shows your commitment to lifelong learning, to professional development, and that you have a foundation of work 
of volunteerism, of, of commitment to the community uh, in terms of uh, working to be able to take care of patients within the community. So as you go through this journey, and now we have virtual opportunities to be able to learn in ways that we never did before, uh, it's not just to get those initials after your name. It's, it's the learning, it's the connecting with others, it's the professional development, it's taking time as you've done on these Saturdays to be able to uh, work together as well as to learn. Uh, also, I don't want you to be discouraged because 100% of people that take the exam don't pass the first time. And so I, if, if uh, you do, when you do choose to uh, take the exam and if you don't pass, I don't want you to be discouraged uh, that you need to continue on and, uh, and learn from that experience and to be able to move on. Just as we're gonna have someone that shared, someone that uh, took the exam and passed, uh, I just talked to a member recently who took the exam and did not pass. And so again, you know, encourage that individual to be able to uh, continue to, uh, to study and to take the exam again. So again, um, take this opportunity to be able to enjoy the journey, to be able to learn from each other, as well as to be able to see how can you um, work to be able to understand the body of knowledge that's so important uh, as we continue to be leaders within healthcare. So with that, uh, I just want to wish you well and uh, again, enjoy the journey. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And let's hear from Jessica Taylor. That was a wonderful message, Michael. And yes, I also would like to commend you all for being here on a Saturday. It really um, it shows the part of the, the fellowship journey, which is a commitment to professional development and uh, continuous learning. I think that's one of the biggest values of the fellowship and becoming board certified in healthcare management is that it, it does have an ongoing uh, co commitment to professional development and learning skills. And I, I think that that is one of the, the biggest values that I've received from it personally, both in my career and also uh, personally, as far as an interest in and staying on current and, and trends in healthcare and what's going on in the field. Uh, another value of the membership or of the fellowship is also um, being able to network with your colleagues. Um, it, when you become a fellow, and I know that all of you are going to pass the exam at some point, and like Michael said, uh, it does take a couple of tries sometimes. It's Many of us are a long ways away from grad school and standardized test taking. And so um, I think this course is gonna go a long ways in helping you um, be prepared for the test. And I, I, Cal does have a very good success rate. So um, looking forward to hearing about how all of, all of you pass it. But back to um, the, the content is really uh, broad and it has really good uh, value in and practical skills in, in using it in your day-to-day -day job. And, uh, and wow, boy, I lost my train of thought. I had a, a, another, another really important part of it is that uh, it, uh, networking, <laughs> that's the, it's the, the connections here. So when you become fellows, uh, you will be part of the fellowship community and ACHE has uh, unique opportunities, um, especially set aside for you when you attend Congress, as well as being able to uh, access, a, you know, the, uh, fellowship community um, and the roster. And so being able to expand your network and to connect with others is a, uh, another really important facet of the, the fellowship. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you all have. I will, I'll put my LinkedIn uh, in the chat. And if you have any specific questions, I'm happy to, to answer that about your fellowship journey. But if you've made it to this point, you definitely are, are well along your way and probably in the end stages. And um, and I know that they're going to talk about the uh, the waiver of the fee in the spring. So that if you wait till the spring to take the exam, that that fee is waived. But also, I would encourage you to go ahead and take it this fall, um, right as soon as you finish this, and and have that knowledge fresh. So thank you again so much. Um, I know they've talked quite a bit. Glad to, glad to be here. And thank you again to Cal and Soul for for putting together this program. Thank you, thank you, Michael and Jessica for those insights and uh, sharing us the values of becoming a fellow. Thank you very much for your time as well. And let's go to the next slide, please. And the next slide, I'll be turning over to Nora uh, Powers, who will be talking about overviews, about how to become a fellow and some resources. Take it away, Nora. 
Good morning. So, you know, I hate to age myself, but back in the day when I was studying for this exam, we didn't have this stuff online. So it's like, oh my goodness. I'm gonna really blast through this really, really quick. We provided this overview as part of the pre-work for this session. And so I'm literally just gonna go through it quickly. You can, you know, call and ask us, you know, if you have any specific questions. I really recommend also calling ACHE, the customer service line. They're in the business of wanting you to pass this exam. They want you credentialed. And so they'll be able to give you very specific information. Um, as we go further along this, you'll, you'll see that you need a fellow re a reference from a fellow within the college. And by virtue of us being here, and by virtue of you being here, um, you can reach out to us if you're not able to find someone within your own organization. So anyway, let me just blast through this really, really quick. There used to be a three-year requ requirement of being a member of ACHE for three years. Now it's only one year um, that you need to be a member. You do need an advanced degree, a master's or other post-baccalaureate degree. There is some information within the ACHE site and the FACHE specifically to help guide you on what that means. And again, ACHE can help you with that. Um, you need uh, to be in a current healthcare management position and five years of healthcare management experience. And we put an asterisk on this because there's been challenges over the years about what does that mean? Well, ACHE has a really good guide, um, a decision matrix that really helps you focus in. And this is where you can receive information from, from your coworkers, mentors, you know, to help you fill that out and understand what, what qualifies as, as the uh, management experience. And if you find that there's a piece that you haven't completed yet, this gives you the focus on how, what you need to focus on. And, and the link is in the FACHG site to pull this up. And a lot of people have found it very, very helpful to go through this. Um, we also have a link further on to a skills assessment, but um, this particular matrix will be very, very helpful. Some of you, I mean, you've been in 10 years in a healthcare management role. You don't, you probably won't need this, but it also helps to keep you focused on what it is you've done. A quick uh, comment, um, Nora, on that. If you can go back to the slide. <clears throat> The um, leadership experience that you need, uh, especially those two areas where you know, directing, um, according to ACHE, it doesn't have to be in your current job. It could be a cumulative experience you've gained right. over the years. So if you've been a director in the past role, but you've taken on a different role, which may be a program manager, uh, but that should not dissuade you from applying because you will still be qualified if you can uh, document those. Thank you for pointing that out. That is absolutely correct. It doesn't mean you have to have it now, but somewhere in your career, and that counts. So um, as proof of how ACHE values lifelong learning, you do need to have a certain number of education credits before you can apply. And 36 hours, 12 of which must be the face-to-face -face education credits. And the remaining can be either the face-to-face -face or qualified education credits. And usually when you're seeing something come from ACHE in terms of a learning opportunity, they will tell you, is this a face-to-face -face or is this a, continue, a qualified education credit? On the invitation we sent out, we clearly state that it's, you qualify for eight hours of qualified education credits for this course. So right away, you're gonna be able to add that um, to your application. Um, and we love you to be here um, in person during our sessions, but we also videotape these so you'll still be able to get the information you need. And this has been this has been the interesting challenge is to identify you need two examples of volunteer um, activities during the past three years, two of which must be healthcare related, two of which must be community oriented. And so it's like, okay. Well, what qualifies? Um, people, if you've heard me before um, in the community civic activities, um, I need to recredential this year. And I've been on the Homeowners Association um, 
here where I live. And I've also participated in some of the, the, um, the Great American Parkway, Parkway cleanup that was just last in September. Um, healthcare related activities, uh, again, you know, Bay Area Heart Walk, um, anything that you're doing in the community healthcare related, um, volunteer activity that you do for the committee, or let me rephrase that, for the chapter will qualify as well. Um, if you have specific questions, I recommend reaching out to ACHE. Um, or like, well, I did this, would it count? Again, they're in the business of wanting you to advance to fellow. And then uh, two references from a fellow, and at least one needs to be a structured interview. This information is in the FACHE site. Reach out to one of us, we'll explain. Um, I mean, it's actually a form that whoever inter interviews you fills this out and then submits it. Um, and what ACHE is trying to do here, they want someone, they want you to look for a senior level executive within your own organization. You can do that. You probably already know several. If not, you can get on the member directory and find someone within your organization. And those of us that are fellows, this is what we do. We want to be a reference for people within our own organization, for people within our chapter. And they would, and if you are reaching out to someone in your organization, more than likely they'll be more than happy to help you with this. So that's what ACHE's goal right now is to get you to go within your own organization if you can. If not, you know, reach out to another fellow. Uh, we're here. We've done this for several of, of our chapter participants that want to move on. And it's it's an honor. It's it's what we want to do. Okay. Um, so the application process, it's again, this is all outlined. Um, you've, all the materials that you need, um, you need to have the application fee. Um, once you once you get approved by ACHE to, to take the exam, you have two years to take it and pass it. Um, you can register for it separately. You do that once you get the approval letter. Um, what would, there is an application fee, but if you normally, ACHE in the spring between March 1st and June 30, will let you waive the fee. And it's like, even if you don't think you're prepared, just take it, it's free. One of the things you get is a printout on what, you know, what your scores were. So you'll know where you, if you had a weakness, if you didn't pass somewhere you need to concentrate on, just do it. Trust me, no one's ever um, regretted doing it when they can for free. Um, once you do schedule it, you need to do, take the exam within 30 days. And then these, again, I had to take it on paper. I actually had to go somewhere. If you go to, to Congress, you can do it on paper there. Otherwise it's at, um, at computer-based testing areas throughout throughout your locations. They're everywhere. Um, you can just look them up and find a location and schedule it. Okay, so um, the 10 core knowledge areas, these are again available on, on the FACHE site. What we're gonna concentrate on throughout this session is we concentrate on structuring and how to understand how the questions are asked. We are going to send you a bunch of information. Um, Rick's most excellent um, presentations as he's pre-recorded, as well as some information we had from PowerPoints back in our early days. And um, ACHE provides tons of information. We'll see that near the end of resources. We're not trying to teach you all those resources. Our goal is to present to you how to look at the materials and how to look at the questions. I think that's been our, our secret sauce with our success. Next slide. Okay, so there are 230 questions, only 200 are scored. 30 of them are kind of like test, test sampling questions. You don't know which ones they are though. So every few years, it ends up being a whole new exam because they'll incorporate some of these test, test ones. Um, they're measuring competence within our industry. Um, it's, it's not totally book learning, although you are going to need to memorize some things like finance formulas. Sorry about that, but um, but at least you need to understand the concepts behind everything. 
And again, it's it's your body of knowledge within this industry. But again, you are gonna to need to know some facts, but that's not the focus of the exams. I say something on the, uh, uh, you know, so there are different uh, cognitive levels of test, uh, test questions, the knowledge, comprehension, and application. Mostly the exams are application, so just an FYI. So as Nora said, we need to know the basic knowledge although, also, so to apply in our daily lives as, as leaders. So. And you know, uh, and thank you for bringing that up. One of the things, it, it, this is a na national based, knowledge based test. This, they're not mm -hmm. gonna be asking anything specific about HR in California, you know, um, or on the East Coast different, or, you know, so it's gonna be based nationally in terms of the American healthcare system, which is screwy mm -hmm. enough anyway, but without having to try to focus on what states do. So again, keep that focus in mind. Um, these are links to the different resources within the ACHE site directly. Um, tons of information out there. Trust me, go out there and you can find these. Oh yeah, can you go back just a sec? So, okay, the ACHE does offer uh, webinars for um, to how to apply and resources that are available. And the next one will be on December 8th and you can just go on the ACHE, ACHE website and um, uh, register for that. And they are live. So they, they want that interaction there. So we highly recommend that as well. Um, ACHE offers also two types of review courses. One of them is um, the Virtual Board of Governors Exam Review Course. They offer that every couple of months. I'm thinking the next one starts soon. It offers 14 face-to-face -face education credits. The cost, um, I honestly can't remember the cost, but by the time you break it down in 14 hours, face-to-face -face education credits, it's, at, it's worth the price. And you get, you know, again, you get like one of these, but on crack with, with the professors and you're getting, and other participants and you're getting the credits. There's also um, an online tutorial, which earns you qualified education credits and also provides um, resources for your studying. And, you know, we've gotten good feedback from other members of, that have uh, studied for their exams and they offer the education credits which you need anyway if you don't already have them next okay so these are two education opportunities that we're presenting just look towards your local chapters for one thing i mean that's another thing that the local chapters do is offer education um, opportunities um Je jessica do you want to talk about this one really quick Yeah, thank you so much, Nora. Yeah, we'd love to have you all join us for this whole annual conference. It's gonna be our last online uh, annual conference, uh, we hope, we really intend. Um, we were trying to plan in person, but we were, it was just too difficult to do A, B planning when we were over the planning for the last six months. So um, the good thing is, is that if you are looking to get the last of your face-to-face -face credits for your eligibility, um, Cal has the, their events and last face face programs and so does Seoul. So uh, um, our, our online conference is starting this uh, coming week. It kicks off with a keynote with Jonathan Wick. Uh, we just pre-recorded it because he's actually going to be in San Diego the same day doing another keynote. And uh, I can tell you that he's got a lot of really great information about what's going on in the industry right now, the trends that they're seeing, and then some forecasts for what's coming ahead uh, in the next year to, to three years ahead. Um, it's all about show me the money. Uh, it, it's not about a finance. We're not trying to duplicate anything that you might be, get from HFMA, but it's uh, we wanted to look at behind the models of, of different healthcare organizations and how it is that they're funded and the impacts of the pandemic in a little bit, but mostly we're going to be talking with these experts and learning more about how uh, FQHCs at Navy, 
um, Father Joe villages, so NGOs, how they're funded and provide services for patient care. Sometimes we don't often understand uh, the structure behind uh, how these organizations are sustainable. So uh, we've got three different panels and you're welcome to sign up for one or all of them. And uh, we just wanna thank all of our planning committee for the time they put into uh, develop these panels. They're, they're great. We're really looking forward to hearing from, more from all of them. Hope to see you all there. So I will uh, uh, drop the registration link into, um, into the chat so you can uh, connect with us there on Eventbrite. So thanks. And this is a local one through Cal. Um, and again, take the opportunity to look at your, at, within your chapter, other chapters, um they're they're not open just to chapter members this one is oh it's coming up soon um it's, i haven't seen this slide so sorry uh michael can you just bring this up really quick i mean oh you're on mute I haven't seen the slide, but Sashan, are you prepared to uh, talk about this event? Uh, sure. Yeah, this is, um, it's, uh, it's, it has, I think, 1.5 credits for qualified education. Um, we have ongoing, we just finished one event a few weeks ago for face-to-face -face credits. But um, this is, again, a, a kind of a critical um, focus area, especially considering, you know, the severe shortage we have on of clinical uh, care providers. And this is a great topic to see from a healthcare leadership point of view, how do we position um, and actually transition our, our APPs into uh, senior leadership positions. Um, so definitely worthwhile to join. So for to prepare for the exam, again, the, this is information that we've gleaned from several us those of us that have taken the exam those of us that have been part of this committee for a while it really is helpful to allow three to six months but if you get a chance while you're still fresh to take it before the end of this year do it i mean the, the key is just carve out your time and do it um use use the information available available to you through ache to evaluate your skill set your knowledge and and then focus on improving what you think you're weak at um, there is this list of uh, the competencies uh, we provide the link here we'll be providing well we already provided this slide but we'll be providing additional slides but please go in there and take a look at that and that'll really help you focus um, develop a plan um, one of the things that we've encouraged people to do after this is at the end of the course, we're going to be providing everybody's information, contact information number. Let us know if you don't want us to, but we encourage you to set up groups within your own, you know, your own cohorts to um, to continue the support and studying as you move forward. And and again, look towards ACHE, um, and and then the local resources that we're going to provide. And ACHE offers the study sets. Um, those come highly recommended. Um, I personally, and you'll see this later, recommend the flashcards. Um, next slide. Uh, well, what you expect for the exam is you need to meet all your requirements, submit the application, ACHE approves, then you register for the exam. And then, um, one, again, once you've registered for it, you need to take it within 30 days. And you get immediate scoring. That part's been really helpful for people. I mean, you know right away. Uh, these are the study sets that are available through ACHE. Um, here at, at our chapter, we have a study set. They're, kind of, they're older books. I'll, I'll post it out what books we have and what versions they are. But with, once you've registered for the exam, we can, I think we have two of them. We can mail them to you if you'd like to use them to help. Um, just let us know once you've, once you've scheduled it. Just a quick note, um, I have been uh, fortunate enough to be a recipient of this loaner sets. Uh, appreciate it very much. 
In fact, um, the books have been really beneficial for me. I ended up actually buying two of these books, Well-Managed Healthcare and the uh, Financial Management is great references for your future as well. Um, I just want to throw in a thought here. Um, before you go out and buy the entire set, think about your strength areas and your weakness areas. Um, for example, if you're like me and you've avoided finance your entire life, it might be worth getting the book. Um, on the other hand, if you've been doing finance, don't waste your time on it. Uh, the one that is really valuable for everyone, I think, is well-managed healthcare organization. And if you don't have it, I would recommend that one. That's the gold standard. You know, and reach out to people within your own organization who's recently taken the exam or recently studied. I mean, I, the new editions come out all the time, but the older editions, even just from a few years ago, are still very, very worthwhile. Um, next. And this is what they call the study bundle, and it's the same books plus the flashcards. And when you get the flashcards, there is an opportunity in terms through ACHE, through your learning courses piece, where you can get the digital version, which what it does is it just, it brings up the term and then the definition, and you can, you know, kind of make your, your own exams over time. Um, and again, I, those are highly recommended by everyone who's, who's been studying for that. And you can buy all of these separate as well. You don't have to buy them as a bundle. Okay, on that note, I am turning this over to uh, Sachin. You're the one introducing Nikhil, huh? Yes. This is Michael. Uh, before we will uh, move forward with, the, uh, with Nikhil, uh, there's someone who raised her hand, Arlene Marie. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I just had a quick question. Um, um, so one of the important things for me um, in this course is to identify you know, well, I'd like to know why uh, I think Michael said in the beginning, almost 100 people fail the first exam. Um, I've had a similar experience. I've gotten all four of those texts. I've gotten all the flashcards. I took the 10 uh, different sessions, the 14 credits, and I'm pretty well versed in my area of operations. And so what threw me was the style of questions and the questions at the end that I've gotten and gleamed off the ACHE, you know, those, um, you know, those videos uh, and, and, and that face-to-face -face course, the style of those questions were nothing like the questions that are on the exam. So I really need to be able to have a grasp on that. And you know what I'm saying? In addition to the content. So yeah, and just why do so many people fail the first time? And I would imagine it's for around the same reasons I might have experienced. Thank you. Hopefully you will learn with the brain walk later. So yeah, hope, yeah. yeah we, hopefully we can help you with that. And I, I think Michael misspoke a little. It's not that high. Um, it was like 60 to 70 percent. Um, passing. Yep. Passing, correct. Yeah. yeah. Passing rate for first timers. Yeah. So it's not as dire, but um, you bring up a very good point. Again, our focus here is not to throw information at you. We've got some and we will throw it at you, but it, it's your responsibility to study everything. We can't just, we're not the instructors, but what we can do is help you understand how the questions are structured. The information we have is a little old in some of these, but the value in it is Rick's patented brain walk, truly. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, so one of the things that um, keeps us up every morning and motivates us to keep doing what we do in helping our uh, members to get better at this is really testimonials um, that we uh, get from our uh, test takers who've um, worked on their own or took help from advancement committee or participated in these sessions or sessions from other states, um, other chapters. So I would like to introduce our most recent success is Nikhil Singhal. She He's actually part of our um, uh, Cal chapter as well, but um, I'm so glad that he's able to join us this morning, uh, give his um, thoughts on his preparation and what it means for him and some good words, hopefully about Cal. Hi, Nikhil. Good morning, Sachin. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nikhil Singhal. I'm the Vice President of Operations at Sierra Health and Wellness Centers. 
And then I've also had a chance to serve on the Cal board as the co-chair for chapter programming and the annual meeting and awards. Um, it's a pleasure to see, be here this morning and see familiar faces and names um, in the audience. Uh, I do want to thank the member advancement committee for allowing me to be here today and for your support, um, not only attending these sessions, but I part of my preparation was also watching the recorded sessions. Um, and so it was great. I felt like you guys were with me the entire time. Uh, I do want to recognize, I believe there's what, 46 people on this call. So uh, what a great demonstration of your commitment to the profession by being here on a Saturday and committing for the next five Saturdays to uh, pursue your, your board certification in healthcare leadership. Uh, that's absolutely phenomenal. And um, that's, that's something really you guys should be proud of. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to acknowledge that. Uh, I'd served on the, I've been serving on the board for over four years now. And so that was a way for me to give back to the profession. Me pursuing my, my fellow status was a way for me to demonstrate my commitment to the profession, um, my commitment to lifelong learning. And so it was really important for me. Um, at some point, I, I had um, maybe like some others, I had put it off for a little bit um, or I you know, started studying and stopped. And finally, it was you know, for me a time to really focus on it. And so uh, I did that. And uh, I do feel good about, about achieving it. Um, but that, that's why I wanted to pursue, pursue my fellowship um, because it was to demonstrate my commitment to the profession. And then particularly for my team and, and the leaders I was working with, it was also to show my commitment to lifelong learning and developing myself so I could also develop others. Um, and so that's kind of a little bit the, the why for me, uh, the how, um, the well-managed healthcare organization book that's already been, I believe, mentioned two or three times. I that book was really, really meaningful for me. I would highly, highly recommend it. Um, the way I studied that book is I actually reread uh, the chapters. Um, I had some previous exposure to that book, and I took notes, um, particularly around definitions and some of the, the tables. And so that that was helpful for me to learn some of the content. I did also reread the uh, healthcare finance book, um, and again, took notes around definitions. Um, these sessions in particular were incredibly helpful for me. And Arlene, you actually mentioned it earlier. Um, the style of question is really different from what I remember from grad school and undergrad with test taking. And so uh, the brain walk, or just even just getting that familiarity with the style of questions and going through these sessions really helped frame my preparation. Um, and in particular, one of the, the things I remember, I believe it was Nora that said it about uh, choose the answer that's a little bit more encompassing uh, or a little bit more broad. Yes, yes. And so like, I'm used to being really, really specific in my day to day. And so like, that was a, a shift for me. And so I would say like, that was one of the when I would ever whenever I was taking the exam, that was one of the things that was probably most key for me is being, oh, choose the, you know, choose the answer that's a little bit more broad, um, which I probably wouldn't do always in my day to day uh, operationally. And so uh, the flashcards were also helpful. I did buy the whole study pack. I did kind of skim through the HR and the health IT, but the flashcards were also helpful with just testing how I knew definitions. And there's an element, depending upon your role, your past, there's an element of, there's, there's, that you've picked up some of this information over time. And, and the application portion, it's not as, um, it's, you will feel comfortable, you'll see things, um, for example, they may ask you to do a really, really simple break even analysis, or they may ask you, you know, what would you do in this situation when you're doing change management? And so those are things that you've picked up over your career. And so um, feel confident in, in your, your prior knowledge that you bring in your experiences when taking this exam. Uh, for me, it, I probably, um, probably the last thing that was really, really helpful was uh, talking to my Cal colleagues about their experiences with taking the exam. Um, I've talked to several people actually on this call or on the member advancement committee and some people that have recently taken it. Um, the, six hour, the six hours when they give that to you can feel a little concerning. Um, you know, are you gonna uh, be in an exam for six hours? It was plenty of time, do not, do not worry about that. 
Um, and so I, that's a, something I also encourage if you get some opportunity to, to connect with people that have recently taken it or taken it in the last couple of years, it's just helpful to kind of hear about their experience as well. So again, I, I really appreciate being here this morning. I'm happy to answer any questions or, or be of any service to anybody. And I'll also place my LinkedIn link in the um, chat. So if anybody wants to reach out to me, they're, they're welcome to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Okay. This, this is our pride and joy here. Um, Nikhil needs to send his picture in as well. We want you to take a picture of yourself, either with your exam scores or, and send them to us and we're gonna put you on our wall of fame. This, this is why we do this. Okay, so, and we're gonna be focusing on this as we go through, you know, we do have test taking tips um, and we'll, we'll drill this down into you, relax, breathe. You need to read and reread each question. Beware of the all of the above, all except. I remember that from grad school. It's like, what? Um, don't stress on the time frames. You can take breaks. And, and the opportunity here is also to mark questions for review. And, and again, we'll go through this. We'll just drill that into you um, as we go through the sessions. Next slide. I think that's it for the uh, for the overview for today. Thank you, Nora. Thank you for that. Very uh, you know insightful and informative in, uh, you know uh, presentation. Um, we are ready to transition now to, to our uh, you know brain walk question and answer for healthcare. So a tweet if you can bring in the slides for us. And I will give the floor to Nora and uh, Rick for the uh, brainwalk. So let's see. Okay, so. Uh, uh, and uh, feel free also to put your answers in the chat room. So uh, we would like you to participate, so. We are kind of running a little behind. So if we do speed up a little bit, please bear with us. But can you go back just a sec, Tweet? Okay, so this, this question, uh, this area is 28. 28 questions is 14% of the exam. And again, as you look at the knowledge areas, and you'll see, again, as you do your assessments, you'll begin to figure out where your strengths and where you need to beef up. But this also gives you an idea of how broad that knowledge area is as part of the exam. So we had sent out the, on the pre-work, we had sent out the, the highlights. These are straight out of the ACHE, um, FACHE site. So th this is what, ACHE wants you to focus on as you study the, this area. I'm not gonna go through them because it's just, you'll be able to read these yourself. But what we wanna do again is concentrate on the questions. And um, as Nikhil said, one of the things is look for the broadest answer. It's usually the one that tends to be correct. When you're looking at the questions, focus on keywords, reread it. Another one of my, um, all of us are points of advice, read it backwards. Sometimes that really helps to, to focus in on what is it that they're asking. And, and then Rick's, the, the way Rick comes to an answer is, is like I said, our secret sauce. So that's, um, so he's the man of the hour as we go through these questions. And again, please feel free to put your answers. Um, okay. okay. And don't freak out if there's a lot of words. I'm, I'm sorry, Rick, were you gonna say oh, something? Oh, no, I'm sorry, no, I thought you were ready. Okay. Okay. So um, the two things that I want to say before I get into specifics, one is um, a phrase that I was given in law school was RTFQ, which stands for read the question and the F is silent. You can figure it out on your own, but it's really important to read it and not to miss keywords. One of the keywords you really don't want to miss is not or accept or something like that that will turn your answer backwards. Um, the other approach that I really strongly encourage is don't look at it as one question with four uh, solutions. Look at it as if you have four separate true false questions. And if you can go through and identify the ones that are false that are obviously wrong, 
then even if you don't really know the right answer, you're improving your odds of guessing correctly, right? So um, there's no cost to, to guessing, right? They, they're gonna count on the number of right answers. And uh, there are gonna be some questions where you're just playing saying, I have absolutely no idea. Well, B sounds good. So the more you can reduce your, your guessing, the better off you're gonna be. So what I'm gonna do, what they keep calling the brain walk, is I'm gonna let you into my brain as I look through these questions and to let you know, I have not looked at these ahead of time. So some of them I know because we've, we've used them before, but um, I'm gonna also probably demonstrate that uh, you don't need to get 100% on the test because I'm gonna blow some of them just to let you know ahead of time. Okay, so I'm looking at this improved profit for a provider service network that contracts with employees on a capitated basis, but pay on a fee for service. So, okay, so improving profit tells me, okay, we've got some finance here, but about the healthcare system, maybe, I don't know. Um, not sure what they necessarily mean by a provider service network, because that can apply several places. But wait a minute, okay, so we they're contracting on a capitated basis. Now that's jumping out at me. Capitated is jumping out because I have to know what that means, but they're paying providers fee for service. So, okay, I've got a contrast here of capitated and fee for service, which of course are very different ways. So those are the things I'm kind of looking at. So what is going to improve profit if, I'm being paid capitated by pay, paying them fee for service. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna look for. Increasing the number of inpatient procedures. Well, nope, if I'm paying fee for service, that means I'm gonna be paying out more. I'm gonna be paying for more services. So that one's false. Reduce per member per month rates. No, wait a minute, that's, that would be a really dumb thing to do because that's reducing my revenue. If I'm being paid capitated, I'm going to charge them less. That's not going to help. Um, increase payment rates to network hospitals. Okay, wait a minute. I'm going to pay them more. That's not going to increase my network. My net, it's not going to improve. I can't talk. That's not going to increase my profit if I'm paying more out. And reducing utilization of services. Okay, so... If I'm paying fee for service, that means every time a service is done, I'm going to pay for it. If my patients are getting fewer services, I'm paying less. So A, B, and C, I've proven are false. So even if I didn't think D was right, it's the only one left that works for me. So I'm going to put in D and let's see if I got the right answer this time. Oh my God, I did. I feel better. We've had our moments, huh, Rick, where it's like- Oh, we always do. But, but again, you know, what I'm doing is I'm identifying the key words there that are telling me what I'm looking for, and then I'm treating each one of them separate, okay? So let's move on to the next one. Which of the following is true about, a, how do we get all this capitation <laughs> stuff? This isn't finance. Okay, which is true about a capitated MCO arrangement? So again, I got to know what capitation is. I better know what an MCO is. Okay, so provider shifts financial risk to the MCO. Nope, that's backwards in capitation. So, you know, the risk is sent from the payer to the, uh, the provider. So that one's false. Provider can bill separately for each service, not under capitation. That's fee for service. That's false. Provider must wait to bill the MCO until services have been provided. Nope, we're paying capitation. We're paying per member per month. So they're not going to bill on each uh, service they provide. So again, I got it. I got false, false, false. So D has to be right. But let's look and see if it is. Providers pay to send fee. Yep, that's, that's what capitation is. So I'm going to go with D. And I'm two for two. I'm on a streak here. This is good. And I see we've got D's in the chat room as well. So you're you're with me on the streak. A, a managed care product, again, we're back to managed care, permits members, I think that should be of an HMO, 
to oh, yeah. obtain services from non-network. Okay, so think I'm sitting here thinking HMO means you've got to get your care within a network, but this is saying allows them to obtain care from non-network. And my head is going out thinking, wait a minute, we have a that sounds more like a PPO than an than an HMO, but I'm not sure what we're asking here. And still have the services partially covered. Oh, okay. So let's see. Carve out. No, I got to know the definition of carve out. Carve out is like pharmaceutical or behavioral health, where they carve out part of the capitation and you get your care out of a different network. So that's not a non network provider. Point of service. Yeah. If I know what a point of service is, that means that. The payments based on where I'm getting it. So that one's sounding good. I'm going to put that aside as a, I think it's true. Uh, preferred provider arrangement product. So wait a minute. Yeah, that one sounds better. A PPO. PPO is where you've got a network and a non network. And the ones at a network, you pay more on your copay or somehow you're paying more. So that one is sounding good. Um, Willing provider, no, that means that any willing provider has to be paid like just as if you're in the network. So I don't like that one. So I'm between B and C. And if you're like me, you can't necessarily remember all the different acronyms. You can't necessarily remember what a point of service is, but I know a preferred provider arrangement allows you to go out of network and then it's paid for partially. So I'm gonna go C on this one. Yeah. Now, see, this is an example of the broader works better because part of a point of service product can include a PPO arrangement. So it, it's the broader of the two. So demonstrating that you don't have to get 100%, and I never get 100% on anything, um, but also why it's important to know the definitions, to know these phrases and, uh, you know, clearly speak TLA, three-letter acronyms. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling pretty bad now because I messed up my streak, but let's try another one. Another payment system. What are you doing to me? What type of payment arrangement? Okay. Healthcare organization is willing to accept third party payment at the highest level of risk. So, okay, so now the provider is going to be at most at risk. So, I'm going to go through here and I'm going to say which, where's the risk here? So per diem, uh, yeah, they're partially at risk. I mean, if they keep the patient in long or enough, long enough, they'll be paid more on per diem, but you know, their their revenue could be capped. So A is a maybe. Organizations is not a payment arrangement that I've ever heard of. So that's a distractor for me. Yeah, me too, but I'm not going to let it distract me. I know it's wrong. <laughs> I'm just going to ignore B. Well, capitation by definition, yeah, we all know capitation is where you're sharing the most risk. So that one's looking the best for me. I'm going to look at D. Uh, case rates don't sound, sounds like epidemiology. I don't think that's a payment system, not that I've ever heard of. So per diem and capitation are both sharing risk, but capitation's sharing the most risk. And I go back and it said, Healthcare organization willing to accept the highest level risk. All right, so I'm going to go with the one that gives the most risk. That's going to be C. And my streak starts again. <laughs> so, and again, knowing the definitions really helps because case rates are actually a higher risk than per diems. But again, the highest, like Rick said, it's like, okay, what's the broadest of those? So case rates are like like uh, DRGs then? Yes. Okay, so just by another name, and I didn't know in that. Patient so. need procedure, doesn't matter how many days they're in there. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Oh, thank God, something that's not finance. All right, good. Not MCOs. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. So the cost of graduate medical education, yeah, that's a subject I know a lot of stuff about, GME, okay? Are of concern to policymakers. Okay, no, policy, I like that, okay. So I'm gonna look for something about GME that is a concern to government policymakers, not provider 
Please, okay. So I'm looking for something that's gonna be concerned to government about education, okay. Number of residencies and residencies and residents are not centrally controlled. There aren't necessarily, but the, I think the payment is, let's see. Number of medical school graduates exceeds the number of residency. Uh, that's a concern, but is it a major concern? Maybe. Managed care organizations are relatively uninvolved. Now, Kaiser will tell us that's not true. Many residency positions are filled by foreign medical graduates. I don't think that would be. What do they mean by many? Huh. So looking at policy concerns, we, we have the fact that we're not able to put everyone into residencies and we have the lack of central control. And both of those are true, but are they a concern to government policymakers for that? I, hmm. I'm thinking that the policy issue is that if we have a shortage of doctors in a specialty, we can't get everyone who's interested into a residency. I'm thinking that's a bigger concern. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with B, although I still like A a little bit, but I'm gonna go with B. I'm going to go with A for this, Rick. Yeah, you see, you should have. <laughs> we'll see. The key to this one, and you hit on it, Rick, was centrally controlled. Yeah. Policymakers hate when they don't have some central control in there. I think I was biased by that because I met a med school graduate a couple of years ago who could not find a residency if her life depended on it and hence was not practicing, even though she graduated. All right, well, let's see. Oh, good, TLAs, three-letter acronym. So which is the following, which of the following is a unit of measure? Yeah, okay. And it's measuring clinical productivity. So looking for a productivity measure for physicians. Okay, RVUs, you know, relative value units. Yep, that's one. CMS is the Center for Medicare Services. We're gonna get rid of that. IPA is either a type of beer or it's an independent practice association, but again, it's not a unit of measure. It's a thing. And uh, CPU, okay, no, that's not a, that's not the computer. What's CPU? Clinical? The practice. central processing unit, if they really want to use a computer terminology there. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, I was thinking, but is there a thing? That, so I'm trying to come up with something, you know, clinical process units, clinical under practice. Cost units. per unit. Cost per, ooh, cost cost per, per unit. unit. Oh, I like that one. Okay. Um, <laughs> but again, I never heard of it. So I'm going to go with RVU because I know that is a way to measure. So let's go with A. Okay. So, uh, so uh, can we go back to that question? So uh, for me, uh, uh, the, the answer is probably pretty obvious, but my recommendation is for you to still go through the selection because there might be a best answer in that selection. So yeah. although when you see the question and you, you see the RVU right away, it's pretty obvious, but don't forget to go over the question, the selection. So it's, it's uh, it, the, the, best, the best answer might be there, so. You know what I'm thinking is to reorder the answers on our next session. Because what, what we've determined, what we think is that CPU is computer processing unit as a distractor. You'll see some distractors throughout. Mm -hmm. So those you can get rid of almost immediately. Okay, um, but that's not India Pale, pale Ale? <laughs> IPA. That could, that could have been a distractor too. But that's no, true. It's, that's um, true. Again, it's a, it's a demonstration. You got you to gotta be able to look at something and know know what what it means. And the... Uh, I always tell my students that they're learning a, a new foreign language called TLA for three letter acronyms and they've got to be fluent in it by the time they graduate. And if your fluency has skipped, has slipped a bit, you need to go back and make sure that you know the, the well, as many as you can, but certainly the important ones and recognize which ones are not healthcare. You know, rec recognize the distractor. So let's go to seven. Okay, population demographic factors. I'm going to key on the word demographic there. Greatest impact. Well, greatest is going to give me some, that's a gray area, what's the greatest. So I may have to compare things because that's 
that's telling me right there that maybe two or even more of the answers might have an impact. And I'm going to have to judge which one is the, the greatest. Okay, so greatest impact. So ethnic composition, certainly an impact. Insurance coverage. Yeah, that's kind of important thing. Um, geographic description, uh, description, probably not. And age, we're, oh, that's- we're, that's get, we're getting mixed answers here, so. Yeah, so I mean, cause I mean, so, okay. So I'm gonna think that insurance coverage really isn't a population demographic factor the way ethnic and age are. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna eliminate both B and C and I'm down between A and D. And which one is having the greatest? Well, ethnic is certainly changing, you know, in the country. We know that the, the percentage of majority minority is, is gradually moving away from majority. Is that the greatest impact on healthcare? It certainly is on society. But for healthcare, yeah, the older people get the more healthcare. So I've been told. Um, so yeah, I, I think D is more than A, but it's a judgment call for me. And I'm gonna go with D. Right. And when you clicked on that slide, you were next to B and I thought the arrow was gonna come up and I was gonna say, what? <laughs> but so far we're getting a a lot of people selecting the correct answers. Yeah, which is great. We've got different answers coming up. Okay, this is one of the ones with lots of words. Yeah, so don't. Those are scary, aren't they? Take a deep breath. So, read, yeah. read everything. Deep breath. Okay, public reporting of outcomes information. I'm going to look at what I've got to make sure what I'm looking at is outcomes because if it's not an outcome thing, then that means it's wrong and has become, so we've got some change, we've got some trending, maybe a high priority. So which of the reporting of outcome is a high priority, okay. Right. So measurement of performance has now become well-established, standardized and accepting by all parties, not on this planet to date. Definitely not accepted by all, so that, that one's wrong. Purchases or purchasers are uh, pressuring for disclosure of meaningful performance information. Uh, yeah, they're trying to make us all better purchasers, and uh, certainly, you know, groups like the uh, some of the business groups have done that. So B B's looking good. Um, consumers are now well organized. Yeah, I can stop there. Uh, no, they're not. And physicians are increasingly encouraging their patients. Yeah, again, not on planet Earth that I've seen. Um, so I'm pretty sure A, C, and D are wrong. And I'm I'm just going to go with B because I think it's right. And I think it is the, the highest priority one. So the one that's most likely to put pressure on, on organizations. So let's go with B. There. And it looks like we had some splits. We had some C's, we had some B's, we had A's, B's. What's the answer in there? B is, B is the answer. Yeah. yeah. B is the answer. These are the uh, key, per, key performance, uh, H, H caps, it compares, all this kind of stuff. H yeah, but, but why, do the, why do the payers want those numbers out there? They're trying to make uh, consumers and, and businesses as sponsors of health insurance. They're, mm -hmm. they're trying to make them better consumers. Why? And that's the trend that we, we should know about. Number nine. Oh, God, back to money. Okay. Health savings account, HSAs were established through what law? Oh, great. This is one of the ones either you know it or you don't know it. If you don't know it, it's just not going to help you. You're going to be pure guessing. So COBRA, Medicare Prescription Drug and Modernization, health insurance portability, ADA. Okay, well, just looking at those four, okay, um, if you're like most people, you have absolutely no idea what is in the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act 
you might remember it as the one that lets you get insurance when you leave your work, but it did, did more than that. HIPAA, no. ADA, no. So I'm going to eliminate C and D. And I believe it's B. And this is one I'm, I'm almost flipping a coin because I have no other hints within the question. So it's a know it or don't know it. And if you don't know it, at least I'm guessing, you know, 50-50 and not one out of four. So I'm, I'm, I've got a better chance of guessing with B. We have A and Bs. Yeah, I mean, it's gonna be one of those two. So let's see what it is. I think it's B. B, yeah. So this is, you know, one of those questions which um, really, as Rick pointed out, you know, you either know or don't know. One thing that helped me when I was preparing was, um, as you come across, you know, there's more questions along these lines, you know, when was this passed, you know, what law, which year, and what was in it, like this example, right? So it's going to be hard to memorize it. So I made a kind of a cheat sheet, which basically had the, the most impactful um, laws, uh, Affordable Care Act, Consolidated, and then the year when it was passed, and one or two things that jumped out for me as a major uh, components of it. And um, I did it one time, and then just before the exam, I just kind of went through it again, just so it you know sticks into my mind. Um, it's I mean th these are simple questions, but it's hard to kind of memorize it. So I remember from my exam, I had two or three questions overall that covered the acts and the laws which were passed, and uh, questions like these. I like that approach. That's really really good because you know organizing it. I mean, if someone handed it to you and you just study it, that would be one thing, but you organizing it yourself really put it into your brain better. So I, I do like that approach. And we have one of Rick's sessions coming up, goes all over rules and rights. And again, the way you've categorized them, Rick, really helped. Okay, well, good. We'll, we'll have that in a few weeks. Okay, most useful way. Oh, God, again, I've got a judge here. Most useful for health care organizations to do with outside <laughs> regulation. Okay. What's the most useful way to influence or to deal with outside bodies? Uh, identify opportunities to influence political outcomes. Um, if you look at what groups pay for lobbying, you might think that might be right, but I don't think it's the most useful way. Um, regularly maintain formal and informal. A little kumbaya, kumbaya there that we're all just gonna be friendly and have these relationships, but I, I suspect that may be the one they're saying is don't just have a relationship when you're being challenged by something. Um, deal with agencies only in written form to have a paper trail. Being a lawyer, I kind of like that one, but I don't think it's really the most useful. It's sort of like there's already a problem and you're trying to get yourself out of trouble. So you, you document everything. So probably not C. Provide only the minimum amount of information required. Yeah, no, that's not a good way for making them like you. If, you, if they have to dig for everything, then they're going to get suspicious and you know, wonder about what are you hiding? And I used to run a regulatory agency. I know that. All right, so I'm going to get rid of C. I don't think A is the most useful way. So I'm going to go with B by process of elimination. Um, one of the things that we bring up is, again, when you see something like only or never, you know, you need to, you need to be aware of those. Um, and this is a really good um, example of that. Yeah, but most still gives you some fudge factor room in there. Of, well, there's two that are good, but which one is the most useful? You know, so it, you're never totally sure of it. And that's the, the reason these questions kind of leave me with not feeling totally comfortable. And I just want to make sure I'm eliminating the obvious ones and um, leaving my judgment to the ones that are, are better choices. And, uh, and this question also is for me, it's derived from experience, actual experience from your you know, operations. What have you, if you have formal and informal relationship with the agencies, what's the outcome? Have you done that in your previous experience? So. It's derived from, I don't see it in the book. At all. Um, for me, I didn't see it. What is the recommendation from the book? So, yeah, it is, it is kind of experiential. If you've yeah. been on the receiving end of it on either side, 
you probably know this one. And someone is saying that with uh, Joint Commission, we only provide the minimum amount. Yeah, but I bet they're looking for more. I bet they're digging. Let's look for an 11. Okay, the principal advantage, again, that's kind of like the most principal advantage for inpatient to affiliate with geriatric care. So, okay, we're back to old people, inpatient and geriatric program. And they're not talking SNF necessarily, the geriatric program is broader than that. So what am I getting, if I'm a hospital, what do I get from this kind of affiliation? It provides continuum of care for patients. Yeah, that's that would be probably the primary thing. I like that one. Uh, permits patients to receive care in their home settings. Oh, maybe. I mean, that might be part of what you're doing if you're affiliating with a home health agency. But is that really an advantage to me, or is it the strongest advantage? Mm, less so. Requires less skilled personnel to provide the care. That will never be the right answer to have less skilled people. And I don't think it is an advantage to me. Is less costly to the patient. Well, that would, if it's true, I don't know if it's true, but if it is true, that's certainly a principal advantage for the patient. But back to RTFQ, read the question. It says a principal advantage for the facility. So that one's not going to be right. So, oh. I, I think the continuum of care is going to be it, that it's going to enable me to provide care. So I'm going to go with A, but I'm not totally comfortable with it, but I think it's the best of what I have there. So let's go with A. I think uh, uh, to Rick's point, always look at, you know, the principal advantage in this case is for the inpatient facility. I think option B and D are talking more about from the patient's perspective than from a facility's perspective. Yeah, so it's back to making sure you're reading the question to answer what they've asked and not get get sidelined and saying, well, yeah, I mean, obviously less costly. That's a great thing for the patients. Um, but uh, that's not the question. The question is the facility. And, and, and uh, selection A, as Nora said, it's the broadest. It's the high road. You can select the broadest because it's continual. <laughs> so it encompasses everything. That's how I see that. So. Yeah, yeah. Your board of trustees has voted to terminate the privileges of a position. So who do you have to inform? Again, this is going to be one of those ones where you, you kind of have to know it. Um, AMA is a, not involved in regulation, so you don't have to tell them. They may or may not be members. Who cares? Not required. Same with the local medical society. Uh, National practitioner database. Yeah, I mean, that is one, if you know it, what it is, you know that they collect bad information about the physicians and they allow you to check before you credential someone. So that's looking good, but I'm gonna look at D. And now yeah, Joint Commission wants to know you've got a process, but they don't wanna know about the individual physicians and remind yourself that not every hospital is accredited by Joint Commission. There are other groups, so that can't be 100% right. So even if I didn't know what C was, what the data bank was, I can eliminate those other three and uh, and go with C. Before we get to the next question, someone's asking us, uh, how are these questions written? Could it be that it's just a badly worded question? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Well, there are can, some that... it could be in the eye of the beholder, but this is why we're saying, you know, you got to be careful and pick out those keywords and work from there. Well, the other thing is that that's the reason they have those 30 test questions. Yeah. And they work with testing experts. And um, the general process is that you want to first give the test to people who are experts in the field to make sure they're getting it right. Then you give it to people who have no idea of anything. And if they're getting it right, that's a bad question, if they all get it. And then your normal people, you say, what's our, our percentage? So before a question goes in, that testing process is really, or excuse me, the, the review process of the questions is real important. And hopefully they're eliminating most of the ones that are you know, potentially bad questions, but there's still some that are, you just leave you scratching your head 
And uh, Arlene has her, her hand up. Yeah, thank you. Is there a some suppository of all of these questions, like from, you know, similar worded questions from the exam? Like, is there like um like a link or somewhere we could go to download, you know, questions and you know, yeah. So it, it, unfortunately, no. No. Yeah. But if you take the SHE uh, study classes, the the review classes they give you more of the older ones but they definitely are older so some may be out of date but you know e even if you use those to go through and do the practice part of it of the thinking part of it it'll help you um, but no there is no big one there is no and, and i think they revise the questions every two years so what they do is they have a group of people uh you know they call it you know test take uh, test composers uh, then uh, you know they, they review all of those questions, and after uh, two years they will re, uh, you know revise. And in the questions, I guess uh, uh, 220 questions out of 20 of those are test questions, wherein they are not counted to the uh, to the scoring. So they are testing those. And then there's a question about uh, sample questions on ACHE. Uh, this is where we gather some of these and some from others that have taken the more recent classes there used to be an old sample test that ache doesn't support anymore however our opinion is there's no such thing as a bad question they may be out of date they may be worded funky but we do provide it at the end of our sessions it's again ache doesn't vouch for it anymore um but i think it's still valid to we Feel that it's still valid to take a look at those questions. And Arlene, if you're the one that has some of the newer questions, um, I'm not sure it, well, we can talk later about whether you felt that they were useful or not. Um, we would love to touch base with you to find out what those questions are and see if we can't help, you know, dissect those as well. Um, that'll always be useful. Okay, we have one more question and then we're getting really close to quitting time here. Okay, effective facilities maintenance. So facilities maintenance, obviously I'm looking at it and then I'm looking for something that's gonna be effective. So it's got kind of a positive push. It's not, you know, failures or anything. So facility maintenance, uh, life cycle planning of equipment. I think so. Uh, up-to-date inventory of parts, not necessarily. Depends on how bad your supply chain is. Periodic update of the schedule. Well, I don't know how that, I don't know. Maintaining facilities on a preventive schedule. But I don't like B and C. I think those are wrong. I kind of do like A and D. A is more specific and, excuse me, D is more specific of maintaining facilities. And A is more of a broader, kind of a broader strategic thing, which if I if I really am caught between two, I'm going to ask which one's more, more strategic, more general. So it's not that I think D is wrong, but I think I think it's going to be A is going to improve your effectiveness. So D is actually doing it. It's not something that's making it more effective. So I think I'm going to go with A. Ah, and I was wrong. Hey. Okay, so what was it? I had, I think I had ten right and three wrong. Um, yeah, actually. Yeah, so yeah, uh, you passed. Well, I mean, so that's what about seventy-five percent or so, give or take. Yeah, yeah. yeah around there. So, okay, probably I made it over there. You are not going to get a hundred percent. No one ever does. Of any, well, maybe they do. Probably not though. Um, but you know, you want to make sure you're really dissecting the questions as you look at them. Don't feel panicked. That's one of the key things is there's a, a tendency just to jump, jump in and go through quickly because you think you're going to run out of time. Um, I don't think anyone uh, takes the full six hours, right? You have plenty of time. Uh, I think I took hour and a half, two hours, and I even went back and reviewed them. Um, but um, but uh, you want to really make sure you're not feeling rushed and you spend the time on the question. And I have a question here. 
you read into all the questions during nursing school, we were taught not to read into the questions. Um, I, not having ever taken a nursing test, I can't really say for sure, but I'm guessing that there were a lot more things that were obviously right, obviously wrong, less interpretation. And I think we're probably dealing with more gray areas. So I think you sometimes have to, and you're, you, what you're reading into is not so much what it might be, but what are they looking for? Really make sure that you're identifying which part of the question is the key that they want answered. So that might be the difference. Uh, I just, I don't know since I can't, uh, I can't speak to what the nursing points are. And uh, uh, reread and reread the questions if you don't understand and you, you don't know the answer, just mark that later on and come back later because uh, there will be more uh, samples of the question that we will be presenting and they're long, <laughs> so. So what I'd like to do is appoint Arlene as our uh, keeping us honest. Um, and for any of the others that have gone through this or have taken the exam, have gone through other study sessions, help keep us honest and let us know, is this helping? You know, what did you find most helpful about what we're doing? You know, keep us honest on this because. Um, so uh, I, there's one question, if I may uh, here, can you please clarify, can you go back and review questions or change responses? Uh, yes, once you're taking the exam, you just mark that, that in, then uh, before you submit all your question, you can go back actually all the uh, mark questions that you are, that's are in question and you can uh, you know, change your responses. Yeah, and you can also go through and redraw, but keep in mind that as a rule, not 100%, but as a rule, you are more likely to change from a right answer to a wrong answer than correct one that's automatically, that's already wrong. Okay, so Go back and look at it, but before you make the change, make sure that you really want to make that change. What's the passing score for the exam? No one knows. No one knows. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. So one thing I did uh, want to bring up, and maybe the committee can also comment on it, which is that the passing score is actually an aggregate um, across all the subject domains not based on, you know, I know we have the weightage for each uh, domain, but if you do supremely well on four of the areas and so-so and in the other ones, you can still pass. Um, I just want to make sure that's, that's uh, the confirmation from the committee as well. Yeah. Okay, so if you have more questions, you know, just feel free to email us, you know, and uh, send those questions to us and we'll try our best to answer. Um, oh, one question says, how many total questions? I think the total 220, 200, 220 yeah. but I think what's graded is for 200, right? Yeah, yeah 200. The, the, the 20 questions are just for te uh, testing purposes. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, thank you again for being with us today. And we hope that we were able to uh, help you with, you know, and guide you through the, uh, you know, through the exam, uh, the, in the future. And we hope to see you again next Saturday. Uh, we will be doing uh, uh, healthcare finance and human resources next Saturday. And we'll see you at the same time and same place in the web. So thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you.